Welcome to the Data Science Institute's virtual seminar series. My name is Dr. Sarah Mackey from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Here at Lawrence Livermore, data science has become an essential discipline in many of our key program areas. LLNL is home to many challenging data sets, as well as home to some of the world's most advanced supercomputers. Our data science staff work in a variety of areas, including machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, statistical inference, predictive modeling, and uncertainty quantification. The Data Science Institute acts as a central hub for our lab's data science activities. We host events like this seminar series in order to introduce new ideas and potential collaborations to our laboratory staff. We invite speakers from outside the laboratory, from the Bay Area and beyond, to share their innovative approaches with our data science community. We are pleased now to include a wider audience in our seminar series through these recordings. You can read about past speakers at our website at data-science.llnl.gov or you can email us at datascience at llnl.gov. Thank you and enjoy the seminar series. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. James Fairbanks. James is an assistant professor in computer and information science and engineering at the University of Florida. He studies mathematical modeling and scientific computing through the lens of abstract algebra and combinatorics. He leads the algebraicjulia.org project. He's won both the DARPA Young Faculty and Directors Award, which supported his work on applied category theory and scientific computing. Prior to joining the University of Florida, James was a senior research engineer at Georgia Tech Research Institute, where he ran a portfolio of DARPA and ONR sponsored research programs. Additionally, James has also spent some time at LLNL as a summer intern. In 2014, he interned in the Center for Applied Scientific Computing under the supervision of Van Henson and Jeff Sanders. Um, so we're happy to have you back today, James. And, and when you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, it's always great to be back. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, my time at Livermore and uh, collaboration with Jeff and Van and um, Isha, who's yeah, in CASC now, or at least at Livermore now, um, and was a co-grad student with me. And it's happy to see uh, a lot of familiar faces. So um, yeah, so I've been working on this area called applied category theory. And I wanna start off with the kind of formal scientific diagrams that scientists will draw, they often, if you just like let scientists talk to each other, they'll eventually evolve conventions um, uh, for how to talk with pictures. Um, they like to draw pictures of, of circuits or um, signal processing, um, block diagrams or kind of Feynman diagrams are for quantum mechanics integrals or these are like quantum circuits for quantum computing. Um, or kind of systems engineering diagrams. Now, scientists and engineers will always kind of produce a graphical language. And a lot of what I've been working on for the last few years is how do we take these, take these graphical languages seriously as programming languages? Um, they are mathematically rigorous, or at least some subset of them is mathematically rigorous. How do we uh, formalize them and, and use them as programming languages? And, uh, this work, this work, it you know fits into a broader. Picture. Um, there's a guy, Alexander Grundig, who uh, was a radical mathematician, a revolutionary mathematician, according to the New Yorker magazine. Um, he like kicked off a revolution in pure mathematics uh, that really started in algebraic topology and moved into logic, computability theory, a lot of a lot of different areas of pure math, uh, but left applied math meaning the mathematics necessary for science and engineering, that math was untouched by this category theoretic revolution that happened quietly in pure mathematics. Um, so I'm interested in that and how do we bring that to the applied, uh, applied math area. So that's scientific computing um, and computational science and engineering. And I'll use all that kind of together as one concept. So, uh, we're really, uh, we're really interested in, in using differential equations or partial differential equations or linear systems to, to understand scientific design. Uh, so it's this project I'm leading called Algebraic Julia is based on taking these, taking these 
scientific graphical languages that people invent, take them serious as seriously as a programming language and build software around that. So there's kind of a, a matrix where one dimension is the different modeling frameworks and the other dimension is the modeling tasks. And so you have this kind of all pairs thing where it's like for all different types of models and for all modeling tasks, how do I build software that does that modeling task for that um, modeling framework? And so a lot of these, like where does this connect to data science, is if we're trying to do um, data-driven science or try to use the techniques of machine learning and artificial intelligence in science, it needs to be grounded in models. So things like model, uh, model calibration, where you're trying to use the techniques of machine learning to identify to identify parameters for conflict. That, you know, that's a data science, data-driven science type task. Uh, model comparison is like given two different uh, scientific theories about how a phenomena happens, decide which, which uh, theory makes better predictions, or, or verification and validation. Given that I have a, a predictive model, how do I verify and validate that it's correct? So all three of these modeling tasks um, have a data-driven science component. And we really don't want to reinvent the wheel every time for every different type of modeling framework. We want abstractions that sit between these two um, and help mediate that. So we don't need, uh, and if we have N frameworks and M tasks, we don't want N times M units of code. So one of the approaches here is to look at how scientific computing technology fits on a spectrum. And the spectrum here is, do you have an explicit representation of the mathematics you're solving? So on the left is arbitrary code. So like these are kind of DOE workhorse codes, right? You have these um, huge C++ Fortran projects where they, it's like a ton of engineer hours, have engineer years, have been spent building these codes. They implement mathematical models, like they compute the solution to a system of equations, or they solve a physical, they simulate a physical system, something like that. Um, but maybe the like the physics isn't in the code. The code like it just does math. It doesn't like know that it's doing math. At the other end of the spectrum is computer algebra systems like Mathematica or SimPy. SimPy. Uh, those systems they take in mathematical expressions, and they produce mathematical expressions. So those codes really operate on math. They're programs that operate on math. They don't, they're don't. they not just programs that happen to solve equations. Right? They, they are designed to, to operate on math. Um, and in the middle, there's domain-specific languages or modeling frameworks. And things like STAN for probabilistic programming or TensorFlow for deep neural networks, they really showed the power of modeling frameworks where you kind of have something that it's not a general purpose computer algebra system. It's not an arbitrary programming language. Um, it's somewhere in between. So I'm interested in how we can use those to do science better. So we've got these wiring diagrams and they all encode different types of mathematical models. So that's for example, circuits or signal processing, chemi chemical processes. These would be like chemical reaction networks down here. Um, and then at the higher level, you've got kind of manufacturing. This is a, a program, like kind of a, a recipe. <laughs> um, it's a manufacturing model. Uh, control theory, control theory, or engineering design a system of systems uh, out of components. How do you hierarchically design the systems? Um, so I'm just going to give it a little example of how these wiring diagrams can be treated as formulas or made rigorous. Uh, and talk about and talk about something called the, which is proofs of inequalities. So I'm really bad at analysis. Uh, my my math brain works more at the, the algebra and combinatoric side. Um, and so these these derivations in like theoretical statistics where there's just pages and pages of um, inequalities, it's a complete mystery to me how people figure that out. I, like, I'm so bad at it. Um, but these wiring diagrams give us a language that'll help make it easier for people like me and also for computers. So we have some inequalities we know. T is less than B plus W. W plus U is less than X plus T, Z. B plus X is less than Y. And we want to prove a conclusion 
T plus U is less than Y plus U. Uh, and if you're good at inequalities, you can just kind of see how to fit these puzzle pieces together to, to build a proof. Um, wiring diagrams are a, a, graphic, a graphical language that incomplete to that process. So any proof you can write, you can draw a picture of, and any valid picture is a valid proof. Um, so the way the pictures work is that when wires run in parallel, that you add them. You add the values on, add the values on the wires. So this plus U. So we can take our T and we can compare it to V plus W. Then now we have a W and a U, which we can compare to get an X and a Z. And then we can use the third hypothesis uh, on the V and the X to show that it's less than Y. And now because this is a valid diagram, it's a you know, there's some like rules for how the diagrams have to work. Um, so any valid diagram corresponds to a valid proof. It's like if the boxes are true, then the outer box is true. So it's like the sum of the wires on the left are going to be less than the sum of the wires on the right. Now, one of the cool things about working at the abstract level of category theory is that you can switch this from logic, that group theory, to chemical reactions, chemical engineering. So if I have chemical processes, um, like these three chemical processes, then I can build this chemical process. And I have a similar proof type diagram. So now these same, all of the software machinery we built for kind of this proof theory thing can be reused for this chemical engineering thing. Um, so that's kind of why I, I'm interested in this applied category theory work. Um, kind of technically what's happening here is that we have a symmetric monoidal category and these string diagrams are a type of syntax, and we're taking different functors and just different categories of semantics. Um, and there's like a soundness and completeness theory uh, there that tells you when this will work. But for the user, like it's really easy to just look at this picture and kind of understand what's happening. It's like material is flowing from left to right. When it encounters a box, it's transformed into a different type of material. Uh, and the, the rules for understanding these diagrams are pretty intuitive. So there are three uh, big uh, type like paradigmatic examples of what's happening here in the kind of computational science domain. Uh, we want to have different le levels, of, different languages of composition. So these are called undirected wiring di diagrams. These are directed wiring diagrams because the arrows have directions on them. And then kind of a stencil uh, stencil guy over here. So you have different ways of specifying systems and then like little compilers that implement mathematical transformations into dynamical systems. So it'll take every diagram and give you an ODE. Uh, and the three ways of doing this are called resource sharing, uh, machines, and the method of lots or stencils. This third one could also be called stencils. Uh, so it is, we have kind of combinatorial syntactic things that let us describe systems. And then we have functors that give us uh, analytic things like differential equations that let us describe the behavior of those systems. And this, this system, like the syntax and the assignment into dynamics is a, a modeling framework. So an example of how we can use this to build better scientific computing technology is uh, a project that we work on for model exploration. So if you don't know how a system works, you might want to explore lots of different systems and see which one is best. So you start at the system specification, you give them dynamics with a differential equation, you solve that differential equation to get a simulation or a solution, and, and then uh, then you're, normally you would just be done. Like this is the forward problem. Like, given a system, simulate it. But then there's the kind of an inverse problem, which is you have data and you want to identify what system you have. So you want to look at so you want to look at a bunch of different options, and then a data set, and you want to figure out the inverse problem, which is like, what system did my data come from? And so this is not the topic of this talk. <laughs> 
but another paper that just got published uh, or will be presented at the conference in a couple weeks um, deals explicitly with this model exploration. Uh, but I thought since a lot of you are interested in data science, uh, this would be a good example to at least think of uh, when your appetite would be. So uh, after we looked at these um, ODE type systems, we wanted to see if we could take this uh, on the road to spatial physics systems. Um, so there was this work by a guy named Enzo Tanti. Uh, he's an Italian physicist, uh, recently passed away uh, last summer. He had this whole theory, kind of like a real philosophy of science, like philosophy of physics, kind of uh, metaphysical, um, almost religious uh, classification of different types of quantities and uh, approach to like approach to like what are physicists doing. Um, so all that semi-religious stuff is not so important. Uh, but one thing he came up with are called Tanti diagrams. And there are graphical representations of partial differential equations. Um, so you have like these oval, oval vertices are variables, and the arrows, which are labeled with boxes sometimes, are constitutive equations. And there's like this whole little rectangular prism, um, even time and odd time, and primal space and dual space, and extrinsic variables and intrinsic variables. It's very complicated. Uh, so we were motivated by these uh, Tanti diagrams. And what we want to get to is a world where it's like so Tanti diagrams are for kind of physics and multi-physics modeling specification and, and uh, we're inspired by this to look at uh, yeah, multi-physics. So in, in multi-physics, what people are doing is they want to like take a model A and a model B, and they both have some common components. They want to compute some new integrated model that has both, it satisfies both sets of physics at the same time. Um, and a typical approach to this would be to look at your two models, implement them in code, and then merge the codes. And that's really the traditional paradigm in multi-physics simulation is like, one group of people writes a thermodynamics simulator, and another group of people write a fluid mechanics simulator, simulator, and then they kind of simulators to get a conjugate heat transfer simulator. Uh, that's really hard, and people have been working on it for a long time, uh, and it's just hard to do in general. Just like take two programs and merge them. Um, so what we think to do instead is to take the models merge the models, and then just generate a solver for the new model. So that's our, our approach here. And so the, the dream is to take this um, void already built for ordinary differential equations, where you specify you like a graphical language for specifying this is a compartmental model for an epidemic. And you generate a differential equation, and then you uh, can run that. You generate a program that solves the differential equation. And then you can run it to get uh, you know, simulations. How do we take this and do it for physics? Um, and just for kind of some context, the state of the art before we uh, were working on this, there's, and this is still kind of a state of the art solver, is SU2, an open source suite for multi physics simulation and design. It's out of Stanford, Stanford. And it's, it's kind of in people at Boeing use it for aircraft design. It's really you know, a widely successful open source simulator. Uh, and Neil Harani had been working on something called the discrete exterior calculus, which is a, a variation of, of uh, that is intended to be discrete first. So normally you would kind of do vector calculus and then discretize with finite elements or finite volumes, finite differences. Uh, the discrete exterior calculus is kind of like a natively discrete version of calculus. And then there was this category theoretic work on dynamical systems, which really had some beautiful math about operads and operad algebras and uh, dynamical systems, but no software. It's just purely uh, kind of this. This would be considered a large and complex system uh, if, if they actually had to solve it. Uh, and it's only got like nine variables. So, 
so no no software or simulator tools based on category theory uh, when we start. So yeah, these Tonsi diagrams were uh, motivating, um, kind of because they're a mess. So so you so so you look at this, and if you're familiar, you can kind of decipher. Okay, I got my, my E field, my B field, and some other fields, and like you can kind of interpret this if you know there's like a curl operator here. Okay, so this has to be the curl of that. Um, the curl of this has to plus the curl of that has to be zero. Okay, that makes sense. Like you could figure this out if you know electromagnetism. Um, but it, if you don't already know how electromagnetism works, you actually can't figure it out. It's ambiguous. Uh, there's not a unique interpretation of this diagram that's consistent across all diagrams. So what we did was uh, invented a thing called decapodes for discrete exterior calculus. For advancing uh, for partial and ordinary differential equation systems, decapodes, um, applied to them. That's what the A is. Discrete exterior calculus applied to partial and ordinary differential equations. Uh, and so this, this decapode syntax is actually like a formalization of the Tanti diagram syntax that is uh, coherent and consistent and unambiguous. So it can be used as a program. So um, a lot of the stuff about decapodes is actually independent of the DEC. So I can explain it with vector calculus, which you'll remember from Calc 3 and uh, to Calc 3. Uh, if you didn't, skip it. this is where the talk gets real rough uh, if, you're, if you're not uh, familiar with Calc 3. Um, so you've got uh, scalar fields, which we're going to call R gamma. It's going to be our scalar field over a space gamma, like a domain, a physical domain. And then our, our squared gamma is going to be vector fields, it's like two-dimensional vector fields over gamma. So um, over here we have scalar fields, over here we have vector fields, and then you have various operators that convert from scalar to vector. So like the gradient of a scalar field is a vector field, and the divergence of a vector field is a scalar field. And in 2D, the curl is also uh, a scalar field. Then we have other kind of arbitrary operators, like f, if it's a real-to-real -real function, um, then f will be a scalar field-to-scalar -scalar field function. And if k is a vector-to-vector -vector function, it'll take vector fields to vector fields. Um, and so you've got that. Um, so this is kind of the type theory of the different domains and the different operators you're allowed to use. And then you want to say, can I make an equation in that language? So here we're diagramming the Laplace equation, uh, or the heat equation, or diffusion equation, heat equation, all the same thing. Saying that concentration, which is a scalar field, the gradient of that is a vector field. We're going to scale that by a number k. That gives us a different vector field, which we're calling flux, v, v. Then we're going to take the divert, and that's going to give us c dot, which is a scalar field. Then we also want to say, oh, I left this, I left this arrow off the uh, <laughs> off the chart over here. But there's like a little loop for d, for partial t and partial t over here. So this uh, dt, this partial t, says that the time derivative of c is c dot. It's kind of what dot means in, in mechanical engineering, but we're going to explicitly represent it by this arrow, partial t. So yeah, so this is how you represent equations uh, in this graphical language. And then the question is, you know, what can you do with that? So what's great about these graphical representations is that you can algorithmically construct multi-physics models uh, from physical principles. So here is a diagram of Fick's law, Fick's law of diffusion. A times uh, gradient. So that's the relationship between concentration and concentration flux. Then the second part of the diagram we had was the conservation of mass, which says that uh, uh, if you have some flux and you take the divergence, that will give you the time derivative of uh, a variable x. And over here, you can think of a concentration being affected by a vector field. So if I have a scalar field C, 
and I have a vector field V, I can compute a flux from that, which is a vector field. And then this principle of superposition of flux says that if I have uh, a flux x1, yeah, x1 and x2, then I can add them to get a flux, a total flux. So from these principles, you can build up a uh, model of advection diffusion by saying, okay, I'm going to have an advection component, a diffusion component, a flux superposition, and a mass conservation. And here we're going to advect uh, T for temperature. And so kind of V1 is the flux due to diffusion. V2 is the flux due to advection. U is our vector field of velocity, like the advective flow. And this V is our total flux. And so we're saying that the temperature uh, is the divergence of the total flux. So the way you read these diagrams are that the junctions are uh, variables colon the domain they live in. The boxes are subsystems. And the wires connect uh, ports to variables. And the ports are label, uh, they're not labeled on this diagram, but they're labeled in the data structure um, that tells you what type of variable you're allowed to connect to. So this advection box has three ports. One is a scalar field, and two are vector. And this same thing for this mass conservation has two ports. One is a vector field and one is a scalar field. So you can type check these diagrams to make sure that you um, connected things up in the right way. That gets towards valid formal verification and validation, where we're talking about uh, showing like, is this model the model, is the model I made the model I wanted to make? Um, and so one way to, to help people figure that out is to this type checking helps catch mistakes in, in model specification. So once you specify each of the four component physics and this diagram, this diagram here with four boxes, you can plug it all together and, algor and algorithmically compute positive, which is this bigger diagram where you kind of glued all the little diagrams together with variable sharing. So this is uh, now the advection diffusion multiphysics model, and is one of the is one of the which is the advection diffusion multiphysics model, which is a bigger model built out of little models. So in order to solve this, so once you've got this model specification, you're like, okay, I'm ready to solve. Um, the problem is scalar and vector fields. Are not directly computable. Uh, you can't directly compute with a vector field over a, um, some domain. You have to discretize in order to compute. And so this is where the exterior calculus comes in. Um, and there's this thing called the Duram complex, which has different types of variables. So you have like zero forms, uh, which play the role of scalar fields, one forms, which play the role of vector fields, and then uh, two forms, which are like they're kind of like scalar fields, but they're defined on patches, ra patches rather than points. Um, and three, uh, three forms, which are going to be for volumes. They're defined on volumes rather than uh, points. And then you have this dual mesh where you have uh, a subdivided grid, a grid, and you have to if you have like a primal simplex, you want to compute dual cells. Uh, there's a lot of complexity that goes into discretizing physics. And what's nice about the discrete exterior calculus is that it kind of handles all of that at once. If you can express your model in exterior calculus, then you can express it in discrete exterior calculus. And there's kind of an automatic discretization scheme for you. Uh, if you work with vector, vector calculus, um, you have to decide about uh, finite element meshes. And, and there's a lot of art in finite elements. So we can express the same system of equations we had before. Um, say, uh, this is the coupling diagram for diffusion. So you have fixed law and then law of the flux. You plug in component models. models. Now this is in your calculus rather than vector calculus. So 
this is the net flux law, and this is the uh, fixed law, and then the composite is here. And from this graph, this graph, this little directed graph, generate a simulator. So this is the, you do the same thing for infection diffusion. This is the infection diffusion graph that I drew by hand in vector calculus form. Um, the software drew it in discrete exterior calculus form for me. Uh, you can tell that this is automatically generated by software because the layout is not great. Um, and then you can automatically simulate and get a solution for diffusion infection. So then this scales to Navier-Stokes. So here, this is a conjugate heat transfer with Navier-Stokes of a viscous fluid in a rectangular domain where we have three um, cooling rods. So they're, they're hot and this fluid is trying to cool them. Or engineers are trying to cool them by using the fluid. Uh, so you say we have a fluid mechanics model, a thermodynamics model, a transport dynamics model, and we glue them all together. We get this big system of equations and we can automatically construct this simulator. So the pipeline here is that the user writes uh, their model in exterior calculus, which is like a syntax. Um, you know, they build these syntax trees and they write equations. Like flux equals this formula, um, the time derivative, yeah, the time, der the time derivative equals this formula. They've got a boundary condition in here. So uh, you write out your equations in exterior calculus, and then you can generate a picture of them, which you can look at. You could draw the equations first, um, but that's like more, it's like fun for teaching people, but serious, serious programmers want text. So we have them write a textual description of the system, and then we help them visualize it by drawing a picture. Um, then from that picture, we can generate a computation graph, which tells you how to actually compute the solution. We can optimize that computation graph using compiler technology, uh, like term rewriting or um, any other, like you can put compiler passes in here to optimize this graph. And then you get Julia code that solves the equation. When you run it, you get this equation. And so, yeah, so we then did some uh, comparison to this SU2 solver to show that, that this technology works. So we're looking at different velocity. We're looking at the velocity profile. So that's this like restriction to this line segment. Um, here, you know, left of the first flow at the, at the first cylinder and to the, in the wake of the first cylinder of the first cylinder where velocity profiles. Um, our lines are slightly more jagged, um, and that's because the uh, SU2, the SU2 code has all this machinery for like smoothing and interpolation um, to help convert between, when it makes a plot, <laughs> it does like smoothing to make sure the plot is smooth. Uh, we don't have that, so we've got jagged lines on our plot. Um, and then, so that was for accuracy. So like we're getting the same answer approximately. Uh, and then look at level of effort. So when you look at the, sim the code that the user had to write to make the simulation, um, they spent 10% of the code just like on imports. Okay, so that 10% that doesn't count. Uh, then they spent 31% defining the physics, defining the physics, three generating the the computation graph from the physics. 33% uh, was spent on the mesh and boundary conditions. It's really nothing you can do about that. You've got like, you've got to load the mesh, got to load the mesh for files. You've got to um, do some IO there. You've got to set boundary conditions and like configure what the data of the experiment is that you're simulating. Uh, so you have to just, it's hard to minimize that. The initial conditions are 6% and actually run the code it takes to run the simulator is 2%. Um, and then 15% is visualization. So just making the plot, right? It's like a third setting up the physics, a third setting up the experiment, and a third 
most of these imports are actually related to y. So a third y. And then a little bit in, in the system. So that's a huge uh, productivity improvement. Um, and when I say defining the physics, when you're working in, in SU2, the way you define the physics is that you just say, like, physics equals conjugate heat transfer. And if, if conjugate heat transfer isn't implemented in SU2, you're out of luck. You got to go and modify the SU2 code base. Um, here, we're actually, the definition of the physics is being counted as part of the the users. It's the user's responsibility to define the physics, um, and there's nothing special cased in decapods for those physics. So that gets us um, through kind of how people can use this technology to specify physics and to build simulators that used it. Um, and it's a big productivity improvement. I think it's a big productivity improvement for them. Um, We'll see how that scales to kind of production code bases. Uh, but there's a little bit more theory I, I wanted to talk about, which is how this approach lets you think about the relationships between physical models. Uh, so one thing that you might want to think about is saying, like, the if I have a physical system, I can think about running it out for infinite to time infinity and seeing what the steady state is. And this graphical language that we've developed actually lets you talk about that in a rigorous way. So the kind of the left face of this box over here, this is the diffusion equation. The right face over here is the diffusion equation where the derivative is zero. So this little arrow here means that the, um, the, the value that should be the time derivative of concentration of concentration, and these these arrows uh, carry data that tell you this that formalize this relationship. So it lets you talk about how well here's a well here's a system of equations on the left, another system of equations on the right, and a relationship between those two systems of equations that captures the the equation on the right is the steady state of the equation on the left. So you have these, um, these little things, these morphisms of diagrams. They have two parts. They have a relationship between the variables and operators and a relationship between the data. Uh, so R is kind of syntactic and rho is numeric. Um, so yeah, we can do this like steady state thing already talked about. You can also use this to encode boundary conditions. So this is how you'd encode a Dirichlet boundary condition. where So it's the diffusion equation again. This time it's been rotated by 90 degrees. So you can see C, C dot, uh, D, uh, D flux, uh, exterior derivative of C. So you've got this. This is the diffusion equation. Over here, you've got something that says that the initial concentration at the boundary, so you have like uh, attrition everywhere, you have a boundary concentration for every time, and you need a constraint that the initial boundary condition is the boundary of the initial condition. That's important. Uh, and this morphism of diagrams encodes the idea of like, here's a system of equations, Here's what needs to be true on the boundary and a relationship between those two things. Um, a Neumann condition can be encoded this way, where you say, I have an initial concentration everywhere, and I have a boundary flux on the boundary of my domain. So this arrow says, like, restrict in time, and that gives you the initial concentration. And this says, restrict to the boundary in space, and that gives you the boundary flux. Uh, so different types of boundary conditions can all be encoded in this common framework. It also, in a really nice way, gets rid of the distinction between boundary and initial. The boundary is just, like, the initial conditions are just a, ba a boundary in the time dimension in a really nice way. So yeah, so this is the 
the full conjugate heat transfer simulator. Um, so you've got your description of the, the multiphysics. You combine those to get a system of equations, which is graphically drawn. There's a lot of like variables that are numbers. So they're kind of like implicitly defined variables uh, that you wouldn't write out if you were writing out the presentation by hand. Um, so it kind of automatically generates names for your, your variables. Then you get this computational uh, graph, which represents a formula for how to compute the solution. And then you can actually solve it. Hey, James, can I jump in with a couple questions that are popping up in the sure. chat? Um, so we've got one question about the computation graph and um, how those operators are performing. Is that done via automatic differentiation or numerics? Yeah, so the operators in the computation graph are done by automatic differentiation or numerics. So yeah, when you implement the um, when you implement the DEC, what you have to do is provide like a linear operate, like a function that computes the linear operator for each box in the in the in here. So like this uh, this box labeled div is the divergence of a scalar field. And so there's a there's a component in our DEC library that computes the divergence of a scalar field on a mesh. So it takes like data of the mesh, like the triangles, the, the edges and the vertices, it takes the data of the mesh, data of the mesh and computes operator that computes the divergence um, of a scalar field on that mesh. Uh, this box here, like sum, it takes two uh, scalar fields and adds them to produce a new scalar field. So you have to implement a linear operator for each symbol in the exterior calculus, and that's all parameterized by the mesh. So you take the mesh, you compute a bunch of matrices. They could be explicit matrices like compressed sparse row, sparse matrices, or they can be implicit matrices. Um, you can make a bunch of matrices, and then this diagram gets scheduled to call the right linear operators in the right order on the right data. Then um, that's this is just a DAG scheduling, like topologically sort uh, the DAG and schedule it. Um, there is there is some integration with Auden if you want to do like an implicit solver. So instead of uh, kind of doing the method of lines and then Euler's method, or like not Euler's method, but a runge cutta type uh, forward time stepping. Uh, uh, do like a implicit solution or a steady state solution, automatic differentiation would be helpful there. Uh, but that's in the future work. And then looks like that's the only, only question. Um, I guess there's one about computational complexity. Uh, it all boils down to a bunch of matrix multiplies. So it is kind of the normal, the goal is for it to produce the simulator you would write by hand. The output of our tool is a Julia program that you could have written by hand. Um, but it would have been very tedious to write by hand because it's like hundreds of function calls. Um, the actual software for doing the computer algebra is usually dominated by like connected components and components and topological sort linear in the size of the graph type algorithms. Linear or quadratic in the size of the graph. Because um, we've reduced the um, we've reduced the computer algebra to graph to like graph to like graph algorithms. That's why we like graphical languages. So I just had um, some more plots that are like philosophy fields are right. One of these is from SU2, the other one is from our tool. I don't remember which one is which. Uh, <laughs> the temperature field. We've got some problems like uh, in the wake, there's some, some error. Error usually accumulates where it's hard. So like error accumulates near boundaries. Um, that's the hard part of physics simulators. <laughs> it's like boundary conditions or shocks or uh, discontinuities and, and stuff. Um, so we have, <laughs> those are the places where, where we have problems. Um, if the mesh is 
highly irregular that can cause problems, but it's kind of normal for, for meshes. Uh, so yeah, so we have two big software libraries called algebraic dynamics, uh, combinatorial spaces that do these, these different uh, parts of the software, and then a third called decapods, uh, which is what I've been presenting today. Um, so yeah, so just to conclude, uh, we've got uh, language for specifying physical laws with these hierarchical diagrams. Um, we've given rigorous definitions to multiphysics and Tanti diagrams. Uh, that was something that bothered me while we were going through this whole program. It was like, people say they want multiphysics, but you ask them, what is multiphysics? And they're like, you know, it's like, it's got multiple physics. Um, so now we have a kind of a rigorous definition of that. We have a rigorous definition of Tanti diagrams that that scales and, and plays nicely with kind of uh, the mathematics of categorical logic. Uh, the software we've built really re reduces development level of effort and increases the flexibility of the software. Um, you know, it's, it really is a generic multiphysics solver. It's not for CFD, it's not for electromagnetism, it's not for uh, space weather or laser physics or anything, it's for any any physics you can write uh, in the exterior calculus. Uh, the simulation is automatically generated from the, the data of the equation. Like the equations are data to the algorithm, right? Uh, and then the initial boundary conditions. That's still an area that needs improvement. Initial and boundary conditions are still hard. Uh, <laughs> and then the, the simulation quality is comparable to kind of state of the art established literature tools like SU2. Uh, there's a bunch of publications. Uh, these slides will end up in your uh, Confluence page, um, so you can refer back to these publications. Uh, what I've been talking about today was, uh, oh, I bolded the wrong thing. Uh, <laughs> paper on grammatic view of differential equations in physics, and then a paper that's still in prep um, that should hit archive in uh, hopefully a month or so. Um, and then, yeah, here's a, a key for all the different software packages in the algebraic Julia ecosystem uh, and what they do. Uh, Decapodes is the, the current one that I was talking about today. Uh, yeah, we have a ton of future work here uh, on numerics. Uh, yeah, Interp interpolation and discretization is um, to integrate with existing software is a big goal. Uh, finite element exterior calculus, which will let us use higher order stencils. Um, automatically choosing the numerics based on problem structure. That's uh, kind of a long-term goal. Lots to, lots to do about meshing. Um, this story should really fit well with multi-grid and adaptive mesh refinement, which I know are big techniques um, at Livermore. And then cubical complexes. Everything I talked about today was about triangles. Um, um, so if you want to get bids, then you want to use cubicle DC, uh, parallel computing, HPC implementations, um, stuff like that. And then something I'm interested in is um, you know, down here, this, this is the data-driven science part. So how do you do model calibration and inverse problems? How do you dynamically choose the right mesh? How do you integrate this with data assimilation techniques uh, to build digital twins? Optimizing over equations with expert guidance is like, physicists know a lot about the physics, but they make different uh, engineering approximations in different regime parameter regimes based on what phenomena they think are important in that regime. Uh, so how do you automatically pick the best equation? Um, yeah, that gets into this learning physics from data. If I just give you a bunch of measurements, how do you reverse engineer? How, how would you discover Javier Stokes from data? Right? The idea that we're going to have machine learning models that can discover Navier Stokes, that seems uh, like a fantasy. But if what it's doing is building uh, explicit representations of the equations from data, that seems more reasonable. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the people who worked on this project, uh, some people at the Topos Institute, some people at uh, GTRI, uh, which is where I used to work, and then 
I'm building my new team here at the University of Florida. And I thank you for your time. Thanks, James. That was uh, very interesting. Looks like we already have a few questions in the chat. Um, Will, if you want to unmute and ask your questions, you, you can do so. Yeah. So, William, I saw, oh, I, no I, I, I read them. So, uh, yeah, William, uh, could this diagrammatic approach be used to select the type of discretization? Yeah. So, um, that part is hard. So, <laughs> So the DEC have, like comes with a specific discretization scheme. Um, so there's two parts. There's like discretization scheme, like finite element versus finite volume, and then discretization like the mesh that you pick, right? Um, and so we can parameterize over both of those things. So everything everything that I talked about today, um, there's like a clean API between the diagrammatic equations and the DEC. So if you wanted to use finite element exterior calculus to get a finite element discretization, uh, that would work easily. That's on the on the roadmap. Uh, just it's, finite element is harder than finite volume. So like it requires like it requires you to know more math. So it has a little higher hurdle to, to implement. Uh, any big hurdles for parallelizing? So there's two levels to parallelize. Uh, one is at the operator level. So if I distribute the mesh, mesh onto a you know, machine, I just have to implement the linear operators with distributed spin B, right? They're all sparse matrices. Yeah, they're all sparse matrices. So, so that should be easy. Should be easy. Uh, then the other part is to actually parallelize the the computation graph, um, and that's just the DAG. So any you know task-based parallelism framework should work. Um, you know you've got a DAG of matrix multiplies that you're supposed to do, and you want to schedule them. So that either dimension, either scheduling like each oper parallelizing each operator, that's standard uh, matrix vector product. Uh, you just have to do the engineering, and then scheduling the computation graph. That's scheduling DAGs. Just have to do the just have to do the engineering. Um, roles other than time. Oh, and I said time at exactly the moment the bell tower rang. Yeah, I, w I was just going to say I think we're right at the 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 top of the hour, so we'll we'll keep on on schedule and 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 here. But um, really want to thank you for your time today, James, and would encourage anyone on the call who sees connections to um, their work for utilizing the, these uh, great ideas that James is is building up to um, to reach out. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to advertise for our seminar next month. If you'd like to join us, we have um, Josh Vida from the University of Illinois who will come to speak on the interpretability in deep learning models for atomic scale simulation. So something else uh, to look forward to. Yeah, um, well, have a great afternoon, everybody. And thanks once again, James.